Welcome everyone to the first uh, work, working group or breakout session uh, of the UNAC Peace Conference. Um, this is the session entitled Occupying the Military Industrial Complex. Uh, so if you're looking for another session, now would be the time to get up and find it. <laughs> <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, start with uh, some presentations from the panelists up here. Um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm one of them, but I'm also going to be uh, facilitating a little bit. Um, and then we're going to have some time for questions, discussion, comments, uh, and so on from the audience. And, uh, and then we're going to, um, yeah, just kind of open it up, I guess, for, for some exchange, some dialogue, some back and forth. Um, I'll say more about sort of some guidelines for discussion maybe when we get to it. Um, but for now, I'll just say let's hopefully keep it sort of respectful, you know, uh, civil, allow people to, to share their opinion. Uh, and so on, and I'll take, a, I'll take a stack of names so we can make sure to get as many people um, participating as possible when we get to that part of this session. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm just going to pass it off to our first panelist. Well, hello. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Leah Bolger. I'm the president of Veterans for Peace, and uh, thank you for coming to our uh, workshop since there are so many other great ones, and you had the choice uh, and you picked us, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I am. Uh, I spent 20 years in the military, and uh, now I'm the president of Veterans for Peace. Um, and I've I've started out being a peace activist, and more and more I find that I am fighting for civil liberties. I'm fighting for First Amendment, and Fourth Amendment, and, and and justice. And I'm seeing how the uh, uh, what I think is the the biggest problem in our society: the disparity between the rich and the poor. Um, or the rich and everybody else is, is what it's turning out to be, is, is really uh, the bottom line problem of a lot of our, of our social ills and, and uh, our, our government's policies. So, but as a war, anti-war activist, I, uh, last spring, we started organizing um, an, uh, what we thought of was as an occupation of Freedom Plaza. Uh, in Washington, D.C., and our plan was to uh, start this occupation on October 6th to coincide with the 10th anniversary of the war on Afghanistan. And so we, we, that, was the, that was the date we chose, and that was why, because it was going to be an anti-war protest. And our intention was to occupy Freedom Plaza and to sleep there in tents and to stay there. And if we got arrested, then we would come back the next day. And to use Freedom Plaza as kind of a central point to go out and, and attack, or not attack, but a, a, you know, to target, I should say, like Chamber of Commerce and the Department of Justice and the White House and the Congress. I mean, that's where our power is in, in Washington, D.C. So people came from all over. I live in Oregon, and I came, and I brought a tent, and I slept in the tent for about a month, and we did that. And But before we started, Occupy Wall Street came up on the 17th of September, and we were thrilled. It was like, wow, this is incredible. Look at all this energy. Look at all this outrage. Look at all this righteous frustration and, and, and mobilization, and people were taking to the streets, and they were getting <coughs> arrested, and they were going right back the next day. It's exactly what we were hoping for. And it, and it spread, and you know, it spread across the country. And, uh, and we were just thrilled about that. But, um, but one thing I, I noticed was that we weren't really seeing, we were seeing a lot of rage about the, the, uh, the uh, corporations and anger about the money and the disparity. But we weren't seeing so much from Wall Street about the war machine. And so I, I want to uh, find a way we can connect these two movements, the anti-war movement and the Occupy movement. Now, my uh, personal uh, uh, theory about why we should be opposed to war uh, really falls into four broad categories. And the first one, which I think is the most important, um, is that it's immoral. It kills people. It kills innocent people. And so to me that seems like the very obvious reason why we should oppose war. But it doesn't resonate with, with people like it should. The second reason is that it's illegal. It, uh, the, the wars that we're, that we're involved in now uh, violate international law. 
in many respects. Uh, it violates the, the UN charters and the Geneva Conventions, the Nuremberg Principles. It violates law. So it's immoral. It's illegal. It's ineffective. War does not solve anything, and we know that. It just creates profits for the war machine, but it doesn't solve anything. So it's immoral, it's illegal, it's ineffective, and it costs too much. And that is the reason now that is starting to resonate with people. They are understanding that the cost of war is hurting us personally. And, and that is a very, very important reason because the, the, you know, the, not only do you have the, the, the dollar cost, but it's the, the lost opportunity cost of things that you could have purchased if you didn't buy war. And we know that, and you don't, you know, uh, and that's what Occupy is about. We don't have money for education. We don't have money for housing and health care. Why not? Well, it's being funneled into the big war machine. So w one thing that, that we, you, we know what our priorities are, and there is a, uh, there is a research group that is called the National Opinion Research uh, Council or Center. It's part of the University of Chicago. And every year since 1973, they have been doing a public opinion survey on where the public would like to spend their money. And there are 22 categories, and people rate them by whether they think we should spend more money on that category, or less money on that category, or about right. And so then you come up with a score of, of a positive score, meaning that the, most people want to spend more money on that issue, or a negative score, you want to spend less. So this is, this, they've been doing this since 1973. Well, since the, the survey started, the top two issues by far are health care and education. And that's what we, we, that's what all of you would say, I bet. Health care and education. Now, um, and then clumped together, numbers three through eight, helping the poor, fighting crime, Social security, the environment, uh, drug addiction, and child care. Those are all things that the average person wants. And this is three through eight. And then the next set uh, is law enforcement, highways and bridges, mass transportation, science, parks and recreation. Do you hear anything like war, or military in there? No. Defense comes in number 18. 18, and it is the first category that people say spend less on. All the other categories, 1 through 17, people say spend more on. Defense, they say spend less on. So how is it that we all are telling Congress where we want our money spent? We've made our, our, our and this, is, this survey's been going on since 1973, for God's sakes. So why isn't it, how is it that Congress and our government are able to keep the big military industrial complex war machine going year after year after year? Well. Fear. Fear and greed, and this is how, you know, we, they, keep, they keep you going. Um, they keep you in fear. Um, one, um, oh, I, I have a quick, a quick quote from uh, General Eisenhower, who's not, no, not known as a pacifist, but, but he understood our priorities, and he understood the opportunity cost. He said, and you probably know this quote, every gun that is made, every warship launched, Every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hope of its children. Under the dark clouds of war, it is humanity hanging on a cross of iron. This is General Eisenhower. So, we know that, uh, but but so I get back to the point of how does it how does it uh, keep keep uh, keep going? Well, it's the profit motive, and we know that. General Smedley Butler, who I quoted briefly in uh, my uh, remarks at the, the last panel, um, he was very well aware of how um, the, the industrial machine is a racket. It is a profit motive, and not just to make. Uh, opportunities for businesses, as he, he explains here, this is a quote from him, um, in 1935 he said this, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. 
In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect reserves in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interest in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China, in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. So. So his, what he's saying is, all these uh, uh, examples he talked about was making corporate opportunities through war. But what's happened now is that war itself has become a corporate opportunity. It's the military industrial complex that Eisenhower told us about. So war itself is profitable. You know, we, we force NATO to buy our weapons and then we, uh, and then we insist that they use them. And, and, um, and uh, 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 adhere to our policies, our weaponry, our techniques. Um, the corporate, um, the big uh, Dyncor and Grumman and Boeing making giant profits, giant profits off of, off of the war machine. And they, um, it's not just um, the, the, the defense corporations, but now we're privatizing things like food service and uh, laundry. These are things that the military used to do themselves. But now we're privatizing it, and so there's a profit motive. And so companies like Halliburton are making huge, huge profits. Um, uh, Blackwater, mercenary groups, contractors, making huge profits. And so the defense industry has become very, very profitable, and it is in their best interest to keep the machine rolling along. So uh, what has happened, though, with Occupy Wall Street is that it has hit a nerve, and, and, and you've seen it. You know, I live in a small town of, of about 55,000. We have Occupy Corvallis. And this, uh, I was in Freedom Plaza in October. I went home after a month. There were 30 different Occupies in my state of Oregon, 30. And little towns, all, you know, it was just incredible. And you've seen how this happened. So how is it? We have people in the street across the country. It has resonated. It has hit a nerve. And we have to build on that. And we have to keep making this connection between the war machine is what is hurting the 99%. That is the big impetus for this disparity between the 1% and everybody else. And so what we have to do is just keep building on this outrage, working together to educate people about the war machine, how it's taking the money from the average person, how when we do, when we, when we spend our money, a million dollars a year to keep one soldier in Afghanistan, in the meantime, we're firing teachers, we're laying off, you know, we're, we're laying off firefighters. This is crazy. And we know what our priorities are, we have to stand up and we have to merge our, mo our movements and, and synergize our energies so that we are one powerful, powerful movement. We are stronger together. Thank you. Okay, my name's David Swanson. Uh, I blog at davidswanson.org and warisacrime.org. I work for rootsaction.org, which is that bright green piece of paper. Uh, I write books including War is a Lie and When the World Outlawed War. And uh, as you might guess, I'm not a big fan of wars. Uh, there, the Pentagon did a war game simulation recently uh, where they simulated how would things play out if Israel strikes Iran. Uh, and they do this constantly for war scenarios around the world. Uh, and a lot of times we eventually end up in those wars that they've played out the war games for, no matter the disastrous consequences that they foresaw and predicted. But they never, ever do a peace game simulation. <laughs> we never invest the resources in building a peace industrial complex, building the momentum, putting the careers and the, and the motivations in place to try peace. They never sit down and say, what if we stopped arming Israel? What if we stopped arming Egypt? 
What if we proposed negotiations for a nuclear-free Middle East? What if we proposed actual humanitarian aid? You know, what if we took a consistent position and treated Bahrain the way we treat Syria? What if, you know, they never play out any such scenarios. And so the military-industrial complex is not just money. It's the energy and it's the thought. And our government in Washington, from the Pentagon to the State Department to all the rest, thinks purely in terms of possibilities for war. They never think about possibilities for peace. And they oh well, we're just harmlessly trying out every possible scenario. Bullshit. They're leaving out 90% of the possible scenarios. Uh, the, the military industrial complex, we, we brought experts from every possible field of culture and politics together for a conference last year and produced a, a book uh, uh, called The Military Industrial Complex at 50, and you can find it at MIC50. 50.org uh, on what it's become in these 51 years now since Eisenhower used that phrase. The economic damage that Leah mentioned is incredible. I mean, this is this is the sales pitch to occupiers who don't get it. It is a trillion dollar banker bailout every year that you never get back, right? It is the amount of money that students owe, every single student added up together for their student debt every single year for what is legally a crime, for what we claim to be against. And nobody knows it. It's not discussed. You, you have endless discussions of the budget where your options are tax the rich or cut our health care and our retirements and everything decent. As if the, the bigger share, over half of the discretionary budget every year, just didn't exist. Because it's not mentioned by either party. Right? So the, the polling that Leah mentioned is great. There's also polling done uh, by PIPE, a, a program on international policy attitudes out of University of Maryland, that takes people, it just doesn't call them on the phone, takes them and sits them down and says, here's the facts, here's the budget, here's what it looks like, what goes there, what goes there, what would you move? And huge majorities say move a huge chunk from the military to useful things like green energy. Overwhelmingly, that's the change that people want. And this was the polling that you saw when we were in the deficit crisis and the super committee was flying in with its cape to save us. They, and, and there were actual corporate media outlets that included cut the military as a choice, right? And it was always second only to tax the rich, what people wanted to do. This was pre-Occupy Wall Street, right? So when Michael Moore came to the left forum last week and said, you know, before Occupy Wall Street, everyone believed in Horatio Alger and nobody wanted to tax the rich. And within six weeks, we turned it around and we got a majority on our side in six weeks. It's a little bit of an overstatement, right? This is a movement begun out of frustration that majority opinion is never listened to, right? We, what Occupy Wall Street has done has been brilliant and, and substantial and has moved opinion and moved the discussion and started activism, which is always much harder than opinion. But we've been there for quite some time. We always think we're a minority. This is the accomplishment, is for us to understand that we're a majority uh, and, and to work from there. The, the civil liberties damage is as extensive as the economic damage, right? I mean, the, the, the groups working on the economy, on education, on anti-poverty, on children's rights, their number one target ought to be the military spending. But groups that work on civil liberties, they don't like having the attorney general go to a law school and say, we can kill anyone anywhere, we can lock up anyone anywhere, and, and acting on it uh, ought to be going after military spending and wars. It's great to see the ACLU table out here in the lobby. It's shocking, in fact, because that is one of many civil liberties groups that will never oppose a war or go after military spending. I hope they do. I hope they have, and I'm wrong, but I haven't seen it. Uh, and, and this is the root. You can't get rid of the torture and the lawless imprisonment without getting rid of the wars. Uh, and, of course, the militarized police come as part of the military-industrial complex. This is where part of the money goes. And we have police for, we have the, the mayor of New York thinks he has the seventh largest military in the world. Right, which is absurd, he doesn't, but they think they are the seventh largest military in the world. They act like it. The environmental damage is tremendous. 
wars and the military and military testing and preparation are the single biggest destructive force on our environment. The, mil the U.S. military uses, in fighting its wars, a significant portion of the oil for which it fights those wars. It is the biggest consumer of petroleum. We have a nation pockmarked with Superfund sites that have been destroyed by the U.S. military. The people in Fallujah have higher cancer rates than Hiroshima. Every woman who gives birth asks the same first question, is it normal? If they manage to get the Strait of Hormuz mined, they're going to send <laughs> dolphins through. I mean, if you care about animals, wildlife, the environment, the military spending is your worst enemy. Where the hell is the Sierra Club? Where, when are the environmental groups going to oppose mm -hmm. the thing that is destroying the environment? Every progressive cause, I don't care what it is. I, I worked at ACORN when 9-11 happened. And immediately, and this was when progressives were on the attack, when we were moving, moving things forward, not defending the step backs, not just fighting off the worsening of the situation. We were, we were ready to, to raise the minimum wage, to, you know, to advance progressive causes immediately. Everybody said, that's all off. That's all off. This is what happens every war. World War I, every war, you, you call off all progressive initiatives. And you can't do that now. It won't work now. And then you have the trade-offs in the spending. I mean, it's not a coincidence that other nations, without our wealth, that don't put their money into the military like we do, have higher living standards, higher life expectancies, lower infant mortality, better education and retirement security and vacations and sustainable energy policies. It's not a coincidence. These are trade-offs we make. We opt to have bombs and billionaires. They opt to have decent societies. It, it, this, is, this is the choice. Uh, and this is not even getting into the damage to our morality that Leah mentioned the damage to the rule of law, which is absolutely devastating, that Leah mentioned as well. And then you have the fact that this so-called defense is making us less safe, is proliferating weapons around the world, is, is causing blowback around the world, and we are stumbling into a war in Iran. Whether we pretend we want it or we pretend we don't want it, a president who insists on vetoing any accountability for Israel at the UN, who insists on increasing the funding of Israel's weapons, and who has now, according to a, a very credible uh, Israeli newspaper, cut a deal and given Israel the bunker buster bombs and the planes that they want to strike Iran on condition that they don't do it until 2013, while progressives are running around this country telling each other that if you just make Obama a lame duck, then he'll be a good president. Right? We, it's not just a profit motive either. I mean, Leah is absolutely right. It is There is a huge profit motive for a certain segment of the 1%. I mean, even Donald Trump says, get out of Afghanistan. I mean, for most of us, including most of the 1%, these wars are disastrous. But for certain people, it's a huge profit motive. But it doesn't explain it. You have to get into irrational drives for power. I mean, it's, it's madness, these wars. Uh, you know, yes, they keep doing them, but alcoholics keep drinking. Right? It's, it's, it's madness. Um, I, I think that Freedom Plaza was a great start, and it wasn't started just to be anti-war. It had a very uh, heavy anti-war thrust to it, and Veterans for Peace was a big part of it, but it laid out comprehensive demands, yes, those missing demands that CNN could never find six months before the first tent was set up, uh, and it went after the plutocracy, uh, the lack of accountability, the, uh, the, the priorities in our spending, and, you know, we don't need more money for health care. We spend twice as much as anybody else for health care. We just waste it. We need a civilized health care system that's not for profit. Uh, we do need money for everything else, not for the war. So we have to shift these priorities. Uh, and there have been initiatives within the Occupy movement in, there, there's a committee in, in Wall Street in New York, there's, uh, there's anti-war statements in the Declaration of Occupation that came out of New York. There are groups around the country that are doing Occupy and opposing the war machine. Uh, but it's not enough. We need to increase 
this this merging of these two sentiments because it's you know the it's not right to say all the power is in DC the the Wall Street has a lot of power but it's not right to say all the power is in Wall Street either I mean those those puppets those irrelevant faces and puppets in Washington are human beings who are actively seeking to corrupt themselves and, and asking to be bribed and choosing to be bribed and doing what Wall Street and the war profiteers tell them to do. So we have to be in New York, we have to be in D.C., we have to be in Chicago. We're starting back in D.C. on the 30th of March. Uh, and if Iran, if the prospect of going into a war that is going to make Iraq look like a, a, a scrape on the knee cannot unite us, if we cannot muster the public force to stop that insanity, uh, we are in deep trouble. And, and I, I would propose to activists around the country that we, that we put a hard focus on the threat of war with Iran. Um, so I wanted to just uh, share uh, introduce myself and then um, just build on what the fellow panelists uh, have said. My name is Brian Quoba. I'm an activist with Occupy Boston, uh, in particular the People of Color Working Group, um, as well as Ocupemos el Barrio and uh, the Occupy the MBTA, which is uh, a struggle for public transportation in Boston. Um, I wanted to basically um, share some, some experiences with Occupy and Opposing the Wars, um, talk a little bit about sort of how we build some of that resistance, um, including to the war in Iran, uh, particularly in an election year with the Democrats and Obama seeking uh, another term, and then um, just draw out one or two political lessons that I've, that I've learned in my uh, eight plus years of activism. Um, so some stories, uh, or some experiences, first of all. Um, one of the things that I saw at Occupy, and I was incredibly inspired, um, as I'm sure m many of you were, was a real gap in terms of consciousness about what's going on in other countries and the role of the U.S. Um, in, in, in oppressing other countries. Um, and I felt that Occupy and, and, and all movements should be international, uh, should be in, in solidarity uh, with, with struggles internationally, which means opposing what the U.S. Uh, is doing in, in, in these countries to... to maintain its dominance. So one of the things we did was we brought a resolution um, opposing the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to the General Assembly of Occupy Boston, um, which because of our messy process, there, were, there, were a, there was like one or two people who were able to sort of block the resolution from being passed. Um, we've amended our process since then to be a little bit more democratic, um, but that was just one example of something we did. Another thing, we had a big uh, UNAC actually in Boston had a big um, demonstration against the wars in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and for civil liberties and um, against USA to Israel uh, in October 15th. And, and it was a huge uh, demonstration because they had been planning it actually in advance before the Occupy movement started. And they, got, they were able to sort of merge with and, and, and generate more momentum uh, from the, the Occupy movement. So there was about 3,000 who came out on October 15th. Um, we also did a teach-in called the Middle East and North Africa Solidarity Day um, at Occupy Boston in order to try to raise consciousness about the fact that the U.S. Um, you know, is giving all these billions of dollars in aid to Israel, uh, billions in aid to many of the other regimes in the region like Yemen and Egypt and Tunisia and Morocco. Um, we had uh, a discussion about that. We sort of educated people about, about that situation. Um, a third thing we did at Occupy was we brought a resolution when there was uh, some of the um, protests reviving in December in Egypt. I don't know if folks remember, there was another huge crackdown uh, by the regime. And um, we brought a resolution to the General Assembly uh, basically that st standing in solidarity with, with the, the struggle in Egypt and opposing U.S. aid to Egypt and the military regime there. Um, and so that was, that was a, a really successful thing that we did. And then the last is we ha actually had a demo against the war in Iran uh, that was organized by the Peace a uh, Action for Peace Working Group in Occupy Boston, um, which has done a lot of, uh, helped with a lot of these, these initiatives. So I think those are good first steps, and it shows that there is, there is the potential um, to build more of an of, of a anti-war or anti-military industrial complex in Occupy. Um, and, but we have to, I think we have to take it further. And one of the key ways I think that has to happen this year is really getting clear and sober about Obama and the Democrats. Because um, not only are they in power and have been, or Obama, at least in the White House, um, but it's an election year, 
which means even more pressure is going to be put for us not to criticize, not to raise our voice against them. Um, and so on the question of war, just to, to limit it to that and, and the military-industrial complex as this, this panel is, is focusing on, um, I mean, Obama has, has really uh, <laughs> at best been as warmongering as Bush, but at worst probably been more warmongering than Bush. Um, if you look at the escalation in Afghanistan, uh, you know, mo many more troops, uh, he more than doubled the number of troops in Afghanistan from Bush. Uh, the drone strikes, there's a vast ex escalation of drone strikes under Obama in Pakistan to the point where, where he's now killing uh, around a thousand Pakistanis a year just from drone strikes. Um, the continued aid to Egypt uh, and Yemen and Tunisia and so on, uh, which, are, which are regimes that are suppressing now popular struggles uh, for, for liberation. Uh, the war in Libya, this is a, a major Obama initiative uh, with NATO as well. Um, you know, attacking Libya under the humanitarian pretext of saving civilians. Um, never mind that it, it's, as it usually, it's really about the oil, and, and they've actually killed many civilians in the NATO strikes. And now, of course, as David mentioned, the, the threats against Syria and Iran. So if you look right now at just Obama's record and the record of the Democrats, it's horrendous. Um, it's completely uh, imperialist warmongering, and, and there's no, there's, there's, there's just no, there's no other way around that. I mean, I, you may not like me saying that, but that's just that's just the truth, and that's what we've seen in, in uh, of these these people in office. And now, some people I think would, would would say, well, but that's you know, the Democrats are really a progressive party generally, and this is just sort of an anomaly, or this is just something they have to do to to, to sort of uh, appease certain elements of the population. And that's where I think we have to look at the Democrats and war historically. Um, because when you look at actually at the, 21st, uh, the 20th century, most of the wars were started by the Democratic Party. For example, World War I was Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson uh, supposedly making the world safe for democracy, uh, in which he led, which was <coughs> insane because he led the U.S., which was itself a colonial empire uh, in the Philippines, Cuba, Guam, and then Haiti, uh, thanks to Woodrow Wilson. But also its allies, Britain and France, I mean, they had massive colonial empires. So if you wanted to make the world safe for democracy, you would have been attacking Britain and France and telling them to decolonize. Um, but no, of course, they were allies with the U.S. And, and Wilson led the U.S. into a slaughter, you know, in, in Europe uh, for U.S. interests. Uh, world War II it was started by Roosevelt, a Democrat, who first uh, presided over increased U.S. investment in Germany as the Nazis came to power because uh, the Nazis attacked the left and attacked the workers' movement, and business likes that. So GM and Ford and IBM, they all started investing more in Germany uh, after the Nazis came to power during the 1930s. Roosevelt allowed oil shipments to Franco Spain. Uh, the war, of course, ended with Truman dropping atomic bombs on the Japanese uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki after firebombing over 64 cities, including Tokyo, before the atomic bombs were even dropped. Um, so that's not an anti-war president. In the 1960s, it was Kennedy and the Democrats, uh, especially under Johnson as well, that massively escalated the Vietnam War to the point of 500,000 troops in Vietnam uh, for a war that killed at least 3 million uh, Vietnamese by conservative estimates. Um, and then again, a Cl uh, uh, Clinton and the Democrats in the 90s using this humanitarian justification for a war in uh, Kosovo, which, um, if you, I don't know if folks know this, there are still... 8,000 troops today in Kosovo, today, because of that intervention. There's a massive military base, U.S. military base, um, in, in Kosovo and, and, and around the region uh, that the U.S. got out of that, that intervention. Uh, there's bases, basically, I mean, and it's a, it's a very patterned thing, right? In Iraq in 91, the U.S. got bases all over the Middle East. In Afghanistan, they've gotten them. In the Kosovo War, uh, in Yugoslavia, they wound up with bases in Kosovo, Albania, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Hungary, Bosnia, and Croatia. Um, so we can see that this humanitarian justification is, is actually a, a cover for what the U.S. really wants to do, which is project its power and its military bases and so on uh, into these other countries and, and um, create you know, uh, profitable investment for, for business, as, as my two panelists pointed out. Um, so that leads us up to today. I mean, understanding that the Democrats historically are not at all an anti-war uh, force for, for opposing wars and actually initiate many of the wars. Certainly today when we think about Iraq or Afghanistan, even during the Bush years, the Democrats supported all those wars, funded them every year in the Congress, and so on. And so I just want to end or wrap up my, my comments with 
what does that mean for us today? Um, and I want to do that by telling a story, because I think it's not just about documenting the Democratic, the, the Democratic Party uh, and their crimes and, and their misdeeds uh, or Obama's things, but it's about understanding the effect of, on our movements when we support the Democrats, particularly in an election year. So just by way of a story, I became a political activist in 2004, and um, one of the things that really got me energized was the anti-war movement. And what I saw in 2004 was a number of opportunities for the anti-war mo movement to grow in which it didn't grow. Um, for example, in April of 2004, the, the uh, Abu Ghraib prison scandal, all the torture photos, you remember this, uh, there was no pro almost no protest from the anti-war movement because many of the organizers and activists who had built the movement in 2003 in the lead up to the Iraq war were now getting out the vote for Kerry and, or anybody but Bush because it was an election year. Also in April of 2004 was the first siege on Fallujah, uh, which, again, there was very little protest because activists were basically in election mode. Um, in August of 2004, there was a big siege on Najaf uh, and al Sadr's forces, uh, the, the Shia forces that were, had been resisting the U U.S. occupation of Iraq. There was zero protest about the siege on Najaf. So that one, by the time November came, there, there had been no, basically no, very little anti-war activity for the entire year. Um, and two things, I saw two things happen. One is, Kerry lost, so the whole strategy of being quiet about the wars didn't work, right? So first of all, it didn't work. Uh, the second thing is that Bush comes into office and now can do a second siege on Fallujah later in November that same year, 2004, where they just leveled the city. And there was no protest because people were demoralized about the election. The anti-war movement had been demobilized for the past year, um, and so there was no opposition when Bush comes back in and starts, you know, uh, ramping up the wars again. And so when I look back on that, I say to myself, imagine had the anti-war movement actually continued to build and grow throughout that year. Imagine if there had been protests during the Abu Ghraib scandal and the siege on Najaf and the siege on Fallujah. Imagine had it had gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. I think two things would have happened. Number one, Kerry would have actually had to respond, the, the Democratic candidate would have had to respond to the movement in the streets, and thereby probably would have been pulled a little bit to the left, and thereby made probably more popular and more likely to win. But even if he hadn't won, even if Bush still won, the anti-war movement at least would still be around, would still exist, would still be fighting. I would much rather have a Republican in office facing a bunch of movements than a Democrat and everybody goes to sleep. And so that's the lesson that, that I, I, I wanted to draw out for this year, because we're going to see a similar thing. People are going to be encouraged to hold their nose, to, to not voice criticism, not oppose Obama, don't criticize him. Um, and I, I think that's a big mistake. I think that we have to continue to build our movements, continue to criticize Obama. Don't accept the, the lesser evil logic that if we just vote for the lesser evil, that'll advance our cause, because it doesn't. I, I think historically it hasn't. And certainly this year it won't. And that's true, by, by the way, and I'll wrap up on this. That's true not only for the anti-war movement, but for any movement you, you, you can think of. I mean, the, the labor movement spent $400 million electing Obama and the Democrats in 2008. What do they have to show for it? $400 million. They have nothing to show for it, except continued yes, attacks on, on workers uh, and so on. And so all that to say, um, Let's, let's be clear, and let's, if people disagree, that's, that's great, but let's at least debate this idea that we actually uh, should be opposing Obama, uh, calling him out on his crimes, and mobilizing protests as vigorously for the Democratic National Convention as the Republican National Convention, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, let's have another round for the panelists, and then we'll get into discussion. Just some quick ground rules. Um, these were passed just earlier uh, in a discussion that happened after the panel. Um, but basically, um, if you could just sort of be respectful in discussion, um, please state your name, your city of residence, and any organizational affiliation uh, before you speak. Please don't interrupt other speakers when, when uh, they're making a comment or raising a question. Um, and please try to be respectful of the airtime. That is, um, let's try to aim for a situation where nobody speaks twice until everybody's at least had a chance to, to speak once or think about speaking once. Um, also, I'm going to try to uh, moderate 
who's speaking so that we can be sensitive to hearing the voices of, of historically marginalized communities as well. Um, and that said, I'll just, I'll just open the floor up. I'll, uh, if you want to just raise your hands. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> I yeah. something before yeah. we open up. Can we limit the comments to a certain amount of minutes? Two minutes, perhaps? Yeah, so yeah let's limit comments to two minutes just so we can get as many people uh, into the discussion as possible. I think that's a great, great suggestion. Um, so I'm just going to call on you probably by a, a piece of clothing you're wearing. I see uh, this person with the scarf. Go ahead. <laughs> I think that the brother there had raised his hand first. Um, I, I like to like run on progressive staff, which means the voices of women and people of color, I, I, I amplify a little bit, so I'm not going to go in order because I really want to make sure that, that we address some of the dynamics that sometimes can come into these discussions. So I, I saw this, the person with the scarf and the person uh, up here with, with the, the phone in his hand, and then I, I have you two on the list. Go ahead, you can go ahead. My name is Denisa, and to stop indefinite detention. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to thank the last speaker that emphasized our need to have a perspective that is global when we think of trying to revive the anti-war movement in this country. And in particular, I hope that questions on Iran and in Syria do not once again become questions that divide us and that blur our strategy for moving forward. The example for invasion of the countries abroad will remain clear in our minds as we continue to move toward these discussions. I'm particularly happy that you mentioned the case of Kosovo and of Yugoslavia, seeing how I'm, how I'm from that region and I'm from Albania and witnessed the displacement of thousands of Kosovars from Kosovo to Albania where they stayed in our parks and, and in our schools. So I hope you realize that despite the, the, the fact that as Americans, you know, we have this need of wanting to help the other countries, uh, the justification of, huma of humanitarian aid is not a way to do so because it suppresses the local movements and initiatives that are rising in those countries. And as Americans, we should respect the right of self-determination of all of these countries without imposing our vision of what democracy should look like upon them. So thank you for emphasizing that, and I'm glad to be here at a conference that is trying to unite all of these different areas of, of anti-war work, of immigrant rights, and uh, against the attacks on the Muslim and the immigrant community in this country. So there's no better time than now for us to unite all of these fights, the brutal attacks against Occupy, the attacks against the protesters, attacks on the civil rights of Muslims in the form of NYPD spying, and indefinite detention. There's no better time to unite all of these causes than now, as the rest of the world is up in revolt. It is our time. Thank you. Yeah. First, I want to start by uh, saying that the industrial military complex is just to protect the export of capital. I mean, and uh, you were mentioned that uh, the one percent benefits, and they got a name, and you know, they can be identified. Corporations like Ford, GM, you know, some of these corporations have lines of production for the so-called defense, but you know, offense should be called. So uh, it's for the ruling class that benefits uh, from this war. The oil corporations, which sell the oil to the government to make all these uh, uh, corporations that construct uh, uh, aircraft, like Boeing that you mentioned, that's a corporation. There are groups of people that certainly are, you know, investing and uh, profiting for war. And also, during this epoch of uh, capitalist, you know, uh, uh, decay, and capitalist expansion and imperialism, the national state is increasing his repression because uh, certainly they want to uh, limit the action of the people. So, you know, every time that historically has been war, always repression against people that oppose war increases. I mean, uh, the Smith Act of 1940, uh, Eugene Debs being locked in jail during the First World War, so it's no accident that these uh, repressive measurements has uh, been uh, taken. It's just part of the uh, logic of uh, the ruling class to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, one of the speakers mentioned about 
uh, uh, pressing the Democrats from the left. Well, actually, what makes that most of the times uh, uh, worse uh, is the amen, eminent defeat of their uh, countries in, in wherever they intervene. LBJ, a Democrat, he didn't stop until really the Vietnamese were inflicting so much uh, uh, the, uh, offensive, and he was certain that they were going to win that uh, the American ruling class because of their and opposition at home that I made the American ruling class to stop, you know, uh, and desist to stop in order to protect themselves. So, you know, revolution is what can stop these wars. Certainly. Could you speak up, please? Yeah, I can. My name is Pam Drake, and I'm a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Um, I do appreciate the panels putting a spotlight on U.S. intervention efforts worldwide that may be lesser known to people, like our efforts to aid Israel in terms of a war against Iran, which um, journalists with alternate.org will tell you is absolutely ludicrous because Iran has no desire to bomb anybody. Um, one of the things that concerns me, among other things, when I look at um, the folks here and the Occupy movement is that I always feel that there's got to be a way to preach beyond the converted. Now one of the issues that concerns me about the issues we're dealing with is that the United States is far from merely at war abroad. The United States is at war against its own people, okay? The National Security Administration is one of the biggest corporatocracies in the world. It has billions of dollars. And one of the things it's doing is it's reading your email and it's constructing supercomputers that can read every piece of your email in seconds. It can read every, it can hear every cell phone call you are making. They're not listening to the Taliban overseas only. They're listening to you. They're reading your email. They are at war against Americans. Anyone who wants to voice an objection to the status quo, anyone who is getting email from Democracy Now!, from Physicians for a National Health Program, they're reading your email. One of the things I think that we need to make sure the public gets an awareness of is the extent to which America is at war against its own people, not merely economically, but in terms of surveillance. There is so much more surveillance going on than anyone is aware of. American paranoia didn't end with Richard Nixon or the Cold War. And today, America's paranoia is not merely present in the form of drones overseas, it's present in the form of people reading our email. Thank you. Thank you. I talk about. One thing is today, Occupy San Diego is organizing a march for no war in Iraq. So that means there are people in the Occupy movement who have drawn these connections, and, and we've been working together with them. I mean, this, this is obviously something that we can do. But I, I think that. Uh, there, there are three points that I tr that come to mind when I, I tr think about how to, how to address the problem. One of them is a, is a little bit abstract. You, you, you raised the issue of corporations. I think it's important for us to understand, even though it's a widespread belief in Occupy, at least in my experience, that what we really have to understand is the issue is capitalism. And if and I'm not saying that we present that abstractly, but if we understand that, then I think it helps to be able to reduce that to things that are more concrete, to things that people really can work on. And this is where I think the connection of the Democrats to the Republicans come in. And, and we have, in fact, uh, been doing that in, in, in Occupy. Um, we passed a resolution of no support to the Democratic and Republican Party. Now, I'm sure individuals will go off, unfortunately, and, and work for them nevertheless. But it, it's something that we can do. I think that. Um, we have to recognize the diversity in Occupy. And that, that gives us an opportunity to develop uh, coalitions. So for example, on October 15th, Brian was talking about what he did in Boston. We had a similar experience in San Diego. We started organizing. We found a student group called Education for All, which was also organizing about, that was also an international day of action against austerity. And we came together. We actually even brought the Labor Council uh, together with us. So on October 15th, we had one of the largest demonstrations in, in, in years, actually since the 2006 anti-immigrant work in San Diego, around the slogans of stop the cuts, end the wars, and tax the rich. 
Uh, and I think that the third point is you, you uh, kind of wrap up. Okay, it is the importance of, of being concrete. And th I think this is a problem that we have in doing anti-war work because anti-war work seems to have this kind of general cloud kind of uh, attitude towards it. But I think that this is why NATO and G8 in, 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 in Chicago was such an important thing because it's, it's very and we've actually won. As, as people know. An another thing, and I'll just end right, with this, just wrap up, is BDS. <laughs> Kwame Samburu and uh, Occupy Boston, Kwame Samburu, I've been active against wars since over 50 years in the anti-war movement, and I will remain active against the anti-war movement in unity with others. And what some one speaker said in reference to the system, I'm totally against the capitalist system. I've been a socialist since 1960. And, uh, just, just a few quotes. Woodrow Wilson, and he surely is a hypocrite, but in a book called The New Freedom, published by Doubleday, some of his election campaign speeches, he said, the truth is, we all call it a great economic system, which is heartless, and the masses of the United States government are the combined capitalists and manufacturers thereof. And also, Wall Street <coughs> loaned a billion and a half dollars to England, and so sure, they were, they were, they were, were not neutral in World War I. And then to turn another story, come down a little later on too. Nation's Business, February of 1968, talked about the war in Vietnam as a world of opportunities for American business to tap the wealth of Southeast Asia. He listed a lot of those businesses. So we live in a great economic system which is heartless, which is true. And even, 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 even during, during the American Revolution, there were some American companies that were sold to both sides. All they're interested in is profits, profits, profits. They don't care at all. This is a government of the rich, by the rich, and for the rich. And so while we continue to oppose the war, we must also oppose the whole capitalist system based on profits over people. Um, Bob Carpenter, um, political activist for 50 years, member of Veterans for Peace, Chapter 34 in New York City. I just want to make a couple of comments. I, I hearing my colleague here from Boston speak. But I have a couple of criticisms of what you said uh, of the left. Uh, during, I don't remember the year, I guess it was 04 with Kerry, um, the left didn't fold up and die. We, we were out there. We've been out there. I've been out there against the war in Iraq since 1991. So, I mean, as far as the left is out there, it continues to be out there. It is, is it small? That's a, 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 a difficult question to define because uh, every Saturday we do vigils in Forest Hills for a whole hour and we meet different people every Saturday, doing it for years. So I, I don't think we should be hard on the left uh, from the standpoint of a closing down shop. We were out there. and. Uh, uh, and one other little comment about the Democratic Party. You are absolutely correct. The Democratic Party has brought us to wars after wars after wars. But don't forget one thing. Although it hasn't been proven, uh, JFK might have wanted to change his direction and never lived to see it. So there is a possibility that the whole Vietnam experience might have changed prior to the assassination. I just throw that out there because it's still, uh, uh, how would you say, a question unanswered. Could I just interject briefly? A lot of people believe that the 2000 and 2004 elections were actually stolen because of electronic voting and black box voting proved some of that. So. Thank you. Uh, I, I saw the person up here, and I'm trying to balance, if you have questions about my style, I'm trying to balance women's voices and, and men's and just to make sure we have, you know, a uh, diverse discussion. So the person up, uh, the person up here next. I got it faster than I expected. Um, uh, Ruth Ben, uh, National War Tax Resistance and um, OWS Anti-War in New York City and War Resisters League and this and that. And um, I guess... I find actually in working a little bit with Occupy Wall Street and through the anti-war group, um, we need a lot more discussion. We end up, I mean, we are getting stuck on writing lots of statements and 
not doing a lot else sometimes, I think, but it makes me realize that diversity that does exist in Occupy and how we still have a lot of issues that we need to talk out together. But we don't want to spend too much time on that. So there's that. And then there's just this incredible number of issues that are coming at us. There's something every day, it seems, whether it's the killing in Florida or now more spying by the NYPD or this or that. Um, and I find it almost hard to be part of Occupy because it feels like if you're not out there every day, then you're kind of sidelined. But um, anyway, I don't know, I'm throwing out a bunch of different things. Just as an anti-war activist, um, I keep doing a lot of the things that we've been doing and trying to keep those issues and the anti-war issues in the network. But um, I don't know how to tell sometimes how stuck I am in some old stuff. I mean, I'll be a war tax resistor forever, even though that's never seeming to be a big part of the movement. But um, but how I, we still need a lot more strategizing of how to get our act, get ourselves more together, and you know how much time to take to strategize and be out in the streets at the same time. It's a difficult balance. So. raised uh, concerns whether or not the Democrats are in power when, when we have social movements and that kind of thing, and whether it's better to have Democrats versus to have Republicans. And I'm agnostic on the question because it doesn't change what we have to do. We still have more powerful independent movements. Nonetheless, history is on the side of, quest, of, of arguing that stronger social movements emerge under Democrats, whether it's under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the workers' movement of that period, whether it's uh, under Kennedy and Johnson with the anti-war and the um, uh, uh, civil rights movement. And similarly, under Clinton is when Seattle happened, and a powerful anti-corporate globalization movement emerged at that time. So I, I, I think uh, it could be a rhetorical point, but one has to look at the actual history when one argues for whether it's better or worse to have a Republicans or Democrats. I'm Ahmad Basti. I'm originally from Iran, uh, but I'm from Manchester Peace Coalition, Manchester Community. I wanted to tell you that I do remember when President Clinton picked up the Secretary of Defense, Senator Cohen, who was a Republican, right-wing Republican from Maine, become his defense minister. And I remember that Obama picked up Gates, Mr. Gates, continued to be a defense minister, what these two uh, Democrat president messages, what they give us, what message they were giving us. The message is that war is a business and it should be as usual as possible, regardless of if it's a Democrat there or a Republican. In, in, in. So, so I wanted to go beyond the Democrat and Republican and said there is a ruling class who run this country, possibly are billionaires, who knows, I don't know they, what, who they are. In 50s and 60s, we knew we were Chase and was in Morgan and Stein and all of this. We don't know who they are, and I think that we need to go beyond that. And I think that I wanted to comment on your statement that the enemy should not go again between the they pick up between bad and good, between the bad and worse. You know, we really deserve the best, not between bad and worse. I wanted to finish by telling that there was a conversation with a, with a black man who someone asked him, why are you staying in the down south, which is full of the prejudice? Why you don't come to the north, which is better? And he said, I prefer to see a snake in the road than in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different between Democrat and Republican. One is a snake in the road, one is a snake in the garden. <laughs> Concerned with uh, my role in the uh, working uh, anti-war working group of uh, Occupy Albany, uh, and I see a, a real dilemma. I mean, the, the real strength is uniting a, a broad spectrum of people. Uh, uh, a previous speaker noted 
uh, Boeing, for example. Now, I'm not near Boeing, but it, it illustrates the point I want to make. Uh, I really do think it's in the spirit of Occupy to uh, finger war profiteers. Uh, if I were living near Boeing and I fingered Boeing, I would alienate a hell of a lot of the union movement. And, uh, because a lot of people's jobs depend on it, even though we all know that this is a hell of a way, that war is a very ineffectual employment program, but it's where you are. So, I, I don't have a solution, I have a dilemma, and I would love to get input into how do you, without violating your effort of building solidarity, uh, uh, how do you finger the, the war profiteer part of this puzzle? Um, and uh, coincidentally, I was just going to say very much, uh, very similar to the last remarks, um, Bath Ironworks is the biggest employer in Maine. They build those EMS destroyers that they're entombing Jeju Island in concrete in order to port them near China. Um, it's very hard to make an argument to people uh, that are uh, economically depressed for several generations that you want to, you know, close Bath Ironworks. Shelley Pingree, uh, supposedly a progressive congresswoman, Democrat from my state, when I met with her just after she had taken office, uh, she said, what do you, they, they come to me and they go, what do you want to throw, you know, several thousand people out of work, your first term in Congress? And in fact, she has continued to vote on the House Armed Services Committee for every, you know, funding bill in committee all along. Um, we're all, I think most of us are aware of those uh, economic studies saying it's a lousy jobs program, or really almost any other investment is a better jobs program. But how do we make that argument? Nobody wants to read a report, except maybe the people in this room from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst econ uh, you know, Economics Department. How do we communicate with people? I'm like a communications person. I'm really interested in strategizing with people that are concerned with communications. Obviously, the bring our war dollars home was a communications effort, really a strategy. Go to where the budget cuts are happening, stand up and go, do you have any idea how much of your tax dollars are going to uh, you know, buy drones or, or uh, Hellfire missiles as opposed to keeping an elementary school open? So I'm really interested in how we can make, in particular, that uh, military-industrial complex is what has cost us jobs, not what has kept people employed just to the average person that I'm standing in the line next to at the grocery store. So, that's why I'm here. I'm John Frazier. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was this gentleman here, Patrick. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to talk about, um, you know, morality, the morality and, and tie it, you know, the morality of the, bam, you know, the moral hazard of bailing out banks and uh, sort of like, um, and, and the, and the immorality that uh, the military complex's job is. And, um, and uh, to say that I believe that if this, um, you know, this pattern of immorality continues within our system, um, that, um, you know, I mean, let me, let me, let me go back. I believe that, um, you know, that this, this immorality in our system has made us more, um, um, uh, more viable for attacks um, by other people um, than post -sep September 11th. You know, especially especially when the the people um, you know who are supposedly our worst enemies are these fundamentalists and extremists. I'm John Frazier uh, from Brooklyn. I'm sorry, I wanted to, to mix up the discussion so we have a balance of, of women and men. I, I saw the women next on the list. Uh, I'm Pat Smith. I'm and then we'll go to the person in the back. Mm -hmm. The Rhode Island Mobilization Committee to End Wars and Occupation. Um, and I really think it was incredibly valuable to hear uh, this put together, uh, all the different efforts that are going on to divide us. And, and to focus on how the anti-war movement can use that. But 
I've been teaching in high school and college for 40 years. And I would have to say, what we need is a critical mass of people who are demanding that this stop. And people are not educated. They do not, they do not see at all the connections. To a great extent, they're not paying any attention whatsoever. I'm now teaching in a university. I've been there 10 years. I'm teaching um, 18, 19-year-olds who are not, who, for example, one person out of 40 had even heard Rush Limbaugh's comment on women. And let's not forget, by the way, that's the, the new one, the attack on women. We put that right in there. Um, they had not heard, they have no idea what's going on in our international policies. And if you even bring a discussion up about it, their immediate reaction is the fear, the security, the, the same kind of thing. So I would like to think, how can we spread this, this knowledge that we in this room have to the, to the great extent? I, I am reminded of the Roman circuses. Everybody knows who's on American Idol. Nobody knows what's going on in the country. So when we think about that, it isn't enough to have great books, like David's written, a blog, because they're not reading those. It has to be a media kind of thing, uh, where it's in the general public. And we need young people, desperately, if you look around, desperately in this movement. And, we, and they have to be educated. And I'd like to think about how we can do that. I'm John Frazier from Brooklyn for Peace, um, Israel-Palestine Committee, BDS Subcommittee. Um, Brooklyn for Peace is a 27-year-old peace, peace, peace movement. It started by resisting the assignment of, of a aircraft carrier on Staten Island. It was originally called Brooklyn Parents for Peace, and it changed to Brooklyn for Peace. Anyway, we recently, with a doll in New York, demonstrated outside of the Brooklyn Academy of Music with the Bathsheba Dance Company that came from Israel. Uh, it was a very successful demonstration with dances and um, Palestinian flag waving and um, a, whole, a whole lot of things. Anyway, I, I'm reminded that this group should be aware of a book called Blowback. It's by Grosvenor, whatever, do you know his name? I, so I can't so remember his name. But it's a very important book of, uh, about American empire. And uh, anyway, that's um, I'm with Occupy Westchester, New York, and Hudson Valley Coalition for Fair Economy, and a few others. Um, I just like to raise the point that I think I mean, we have to look at things in terms of short term and long term goals. Um, a long term goal, I think, is really changing the educational ideology of our country. At this point in time, there's a lot of our educational system promotes the ideology of war. If we look at um, what's taught in history classes, is that the only reason we got out of uh, the Depression is because we went into World War II. I mean, that ideology is going to shape the way we look at the world and how we kind of let us agree with the horrible decisions that our country has made. Um, so I think that, in part, we need to look at the education of our youngsters um, prior to college or high school, I mean, it's the, the basic notions of what we are being taught is that going to war is a positive. And I think that is really what needs to be focused on um, in terms of long-term change. I also think that we need to shift the cultural ideology of our country, as, I mean, everybody probably, <laughs> that's a really broad term, but, um, you know, the, the notion that this, you know, the Roman circus, I think, is a really apt... Um, analogy, I think that we have so many tools right now that we really are in a shifting 
uh, culture where Facebook and and these social media tools can allow us to, to make this change and, and um, education is available for everyone, I think, finally, but um, if you want to search for it, but I think changing the cultural act, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. I'm done, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My name's Tom Ellis, I live in Albany and I work with the Citizens Environmental Coalition. In answer to Michael, Wright's, Michael Rice's question about how do we work with labor when we want to basically shut down the military industries that they work in, and just a, a brief history lesson here. In 1962, George McGovern got elected to the U.S. Senate, and he ran on a platform of peaceful economic conversion of the United States economy. And in October 31st, 1963, he introduced a bill with 31 co-sponsors in the Senate, which would have required any company in the United States that's a defense contractor and that also has more than 100 employees had to set up a committee to begin looking at how they would continue operating their business and keeping people employed, what products could they produce or what services they could provide if their defense contracts were suddenly lost. And um, the fact that he had 31 co-sponsors shows that there was quite a bit of interest in it at the time. And in a book that he wrote, he said that 20 or 30 other senators told him that they would sign out to the bill if Kennedy endorsed the bill. Three weeks later, Kennedy got killed, and Johnson was, had no interest in that idea of peaceful economic conversion whatsoever. And the idea died then, and that was as close as we ever came to having a real solution to your question there. Of working with labor, you know, we want you to have work, we want you to have jobs, but we want you to do something different. So we need to look at our history, and uh, you know, maybe that's the way to go in the future. My name is Jason McGahey. I'm, I'm coming from uh, Occupy DC, uh, and I just wanted to uh, I thank everyone for like, uh, it's been a lot of great discussion and, and, and insights. Um, I wanted to talk to everybody about, uh, with Occupy DC, where we're, uh, the, the IMF and World Bank are going to be meeting in DC in April, and it's kind of the economic arm of the, uh, of the war machine. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like the, uh, the austerity measures that have been going on in the US and Europe the last several months have been the, uh, the austerity measures that the US has been pushing on the rest of the world for, for decades, and so it's where we're trying to, to have people out there to, to fight against uh, uh, economic imperialism and, and everything like that. Uh, I, I have flyers if anyone would like to discuss it. Well, I, if, if you're like me, you, you've heard virtually nothing said in this room that you disagreed with. Uh, I mean, we really are the choir. Uh, doesn't mean we can't sing better, doesn't mean we can't be better connected with each other, uh, but I think that you know, it, it, we, we have to reach out to others in the Occupy movement, which creates this great opportunity to reach people who are active but not on that issue. But we also have to look to groups that we're part of, school groups, teachers groups, economic groups, civil liberties groups, environmental groups, uh, organizations that work on education, children's issues, and say, this is the number one opponent, the military spending, and if we were all together on it, we could defeat it. Uh, I, I think we have a responsibility to remind people that we were lied into Iraq because they knew it and they're forgetting it and, and tell people they lied to us last time, they're lying to us this time. Uh, I think it's okay in this room of comrades where we understand defense as code for mass murder to say defense uh, as many people have been doing today but I would, you know, not everybody knows that. Uh, and nobody wants to cut money for defense. So I would urge you to try extremely hard to stop saying that. Uh, it's, it's the military. It's not defensive. Uh, in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, we got a resolution passed not just by Occupy Charlottesville, but by Charlottesville City Council saying, do not attack Iran. And we heard from groups all around the country, oh, we want to do that too. And as far as I know, nobody has done it yet. But when you put this kind of resolution before the public, whether it's on bring the war dollars home and cut the military spending, here's what we want the money for, or don't attack Iran, or both, uh, you, can, you can force individuals and groups to choose which side are you on. Are you going to be on the wrong side? And you can point out who was wrong in 2002, 2003, and who was right, and, and the identical nature of the decision now and force this conversation. Uh, and, and I would add 
that in opposing violence, we need to use nonviolence, uh, and that embracing the inclusivity of diversity of tactics, because 45 people at your meeting wanted a strictly nonviolent campaign that couldn't be blamed for violence and would have the power to bring people into the movement, and three people wanted to break windows, is not that you know that's not democracy that's not collective decision making that's not consensus it's a lack of spine uh, it's a failure to uh, to decide on a strategic decision that the vast majority of your people wanted we we need a non violent active aggressive movement uh, to end this and in defense of books Teachers use my books in their schools. People tell me they've changed them, so I, I, I can't 100% throw out uh, the written word yet. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of you three might have been agents provocateurs. What I wonder. It's possible, as long as they pay money. <laughs> um, I'll just I'll stand so I can see you. Um, um, I, I, I just think I am so excited. This is uh, I haven't been a peace activist as long as as probably most of you have, but in my time of activism, this is, this is, I think, the cusp. This is that we have touched nerve that is resonating with people all over the country, all over the world. And we have seen people, the, the, the oppressed majority, rising up, finding their strength, finding their solidarity with each other to reclaim their power. Uh, democracy means people, people of power. And so we, we are reclaiming that, and then we are finding our voice. And it, we have so much in common, we just have to, who mentioned strategy? Uh, we, we need to strategize better on how we, can, um, how we can flex our power, how we can impact the system, how we can reclaim what is ours. And uh, it's, it is going to take a lot of work. It's not going to happen overnight, but we have to start thinking uh, from the beginning of the educational system that, that she mentioned. You know, when we're brought up as young people, uh, children, we have to, get, we have to uh, fight against this idea of this is the best country in the world and we are right and we are, you know, our lives are more important than those of other people. And if we... Can, um, I saw the picture um, of the, pa the uh, drone, the children killed by the drones that you're wearing. If we could think of all children as equally valuable, and if we could, if we could just do that one thing, we would stop war. Americans would not allow that to, to continue. I, I just have to believe that, that uh, if, if Americans could see the real problems, the real harm that they're doing, they could see the faces of the children, they would say no. And they would not allow their own children to be killed for, for the American way of life. So why is it okay to, to, to kill the children of other countries? And so we, we just have to keep working on our humanity, uh, the moral argument, and find where we can make inroads with the economic argument. We build on that and take it where we can. So thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to come back on the question raised about communicating with workers, um, because I think that's a really important question. I think that um, part, of, part of how I would answer that is that workers, whether they're in the military industry or not, we're all kind of part of this military complex, because um, I think there's different, there's different wings of it, right? There's, there's the banks, which have all the, uh, the capital and the interests in a lot of these countries. Um, there's oil companies who have interests and so on. And so I think um, we have to begin to talk about the fact that it's really this, this bigger system. It's not just the military industry, but th there's this whole sort of social and economic infrastructure that we're all a part of uh, in one way or another, and we all actually need to be begin uh, opposing it. Um, the other thing, just more concretely for those workers, though, I would say um, there's a great book uh, called, I think, The Green Economy. Um, it's about alternatives. It's about not only do you want to be able to argue against something, but you want to be able to argue for something. Uh, the book, it's by Van Jones, who I have various criticisms of, uh, including his support for the Democrats and Obama. But he has a really good idea, which is that all these workers, not only um, in military industries, but also in places like Detroit that have been de-industrialized and lost a lot of their, their, their factory jobs, 
they're high, there's a high skilled workforce there, and there's a need for uh, green, you know, alternative sustainable technology and energy, why not put those high skilled uh, machinists and workers to work building wind turbines? Then you create jobs, you have green, sustainable energy sources, it, it's, it solves kind of two birds with one stone. So I think having an alternative to argue for um, can be also helpful in some of those discussions. Um, the last thing I'll say, I, I just wanted to agree with, with Leah that now is really the time. I mean, there's, there's, I think Occupy has, has sort of like opened up this new space for us and we're seeing it with the Trayvon Martin protests, you know, uh, thousands in New York City protesting for the, the killing of, of, of the young man in, in Florida. Um, we had hundreds in Boston just uh, two nights ago. There have been places in D.C. There have been protests. I think that's an, a, a little example of, of how we're really, we really are entering a new moment and it's time to really to really seize on that. Um, the, the other thing in terms of making the case is like, if you want your issue heard, I would say come to Occupy. Uh, I, I unabashedly, unashamedly invite you to join Occupy because Occupy has shifted the national discourse. So whatever comes into Occupy, uh, if, it can, if, if the anti-war and military industrial consciousness can come into Occupy, that can be a part of this big thing that's shifting the national discourse. Um, and that, that could help play a role as well. The last thing I'll just finish on is that Despite this huge opportunity and this great emerging struggle that we're seeing um, in the U.S. and, of course, internationally, there's this pressure of lesser evilism that's going to become really, really intense this year. And I just want people to be aware of it and conscious of it now because what will happen is they'll, they'll want us to forget that it was the Democrats in Boston that repressed Occupy in New York. In, uh, Sorry, in, in the Oakland, in Los Angeles, in, in Syracuse, in, Syracuse, in St. Louis, in Seattle, uh, in Atlanta, all Democrats. It was basically all the, the Democratic mayors that sent the cops in to smash the Occupy movement. They want us to forget that. They want us to forget that Obama has sanctioned assassination anywhere without, for, for any reason, uh, assassinating anyone or detaining people indefinitely without any cause. They want us to forget all of that and sort of tow, tow things down. I think Seren is right that the movements have emerged under under Democrats, um, but look at the election years, right? When, when there's an election year, even when those Democrats have been in power, there's always a dip in movement activity because of, uh, because of the pressure of lesser evilism and the weight of that, that argument. So we need, to, we need to completely counteract that this year and, and continue to build on all those inspiring things that are beginning to bubble up. Um, with that said, I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Thank you for coming.